The International Prize in Statistics is one of the highest honors in the field, or some people consider it to be the Nobel Prize in Statistics. To win this prize, one must make a monumental contribution to the field of statistics. I've talked about these far before, but this person is the most recent winner. In this video, I want to tell you a little bit more about them and talk about the idea that won them the Nobel Prize in Statistics. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. Without further ado, the winner of the 2025 International Prize in Statistics is none other than Professor Grace Waba. Professor Waba majored in math at Cornell at a time where only two Ivy League schools admitted women. She got her master's at the University of Maryland and got her PhD in statistics at Stanford University. She became the first female faculty member in the Department of Statistics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I highly recommend reading this article walking through her life and her major achievements. Professor Wabo is known for many things, including the idea of generalized cross-validation and the eponymous Wabo's problem. But the reason she won the International Prize in Statistics was due to her work with smoothing splines. Smoothing splines are a relatively advanced statistical method, so I don't blame you if you haven't really used them or even heard of them before. Even for me, neither my master's nor my PhD coursework really covered them. I'll do my best to give you a big picture view of what smoothing splines are. If I got something wrong, please let me know in the comments so that I and others can learn. Smoothing splines are a way to flexibly model what Grace Waba called noisy data. We have some predictor X and some outcome Y. For now, I'm only going to consider the case for a scalar predictor and a scalar outcome, but we'll circle back to this. The relationship between X and Y is denoted by a function f. And this function tells us how to take the value of the predictor and use it to predict the value of the outcome. But this relationship is polluted by noise, denoted by this epsilon term. This noise makes it so that we don't observe the exact value of the function evaluated at the predictor. Instead, we observe this outcome y, that is the sum of both the true relationship of f of x and this noise. We usually have some extra assumptions on this noise, but they're not important here. If you've been following my channel for a while, you've already seen a special case of this model, linear regression. This model simplifies the relationship because it can be summarized with just a few numbers, the regression coefficients. Once we estimate these coefficients, we have the whole function and we can start making predictions. But the simplification is both a blessing and a curse. The linearity assumption greatly simplifies the task of getting a usable predictive model, but it's also a really strong assumption. Sure, lots of relationships out there are more or less linear but many, many more of them are better described as not linear. So we've got to go back to the more general version of the model. We have a problem. Despite how simple this notation is, functions are infinitely harder to estimate compared to a parametric model like linear regression. In statistics, we refer to functions as infinite dimensional objects, and these are at the heart of non-parametric statistics. Since you're a 3D person like me, the idea of infinitely many dimensions might sound weird, so here's a quick intuition. Consider a predictor that can be a real number just between 0 and 1. This interval might seem small, but there are actually infinitely many values that the predictor can take, since it's a real number. This means that there are also infinitely many values the function can take. To estimate this function naively, we need to estimate infinitely many values to recreate it, and not even the most powerful computers on Earth can deal with that. I hope this gives you enough context, because this is a really hard problem we need to deal with. To be more precise, let me frame this problem in statistical terms. We've collected a data set consisting of n pairs of observations. Each predictor is paired with an outcome. Our goal is to estimate this function that relates the predictor to the outcome. Since it's an estimate, we'll name it f hat. Done right, f hat will enable us to make useful predictions despite the noise that contaminates the data. That being said, how should we define f hat? The classic way to define it is the function that minimizes what's called the penalized least squares criterion. The criterion is split into two terms, the least squares term and a penalty term. The least squares term indicates that we'd like our estimated function to be as close as possible to the observed outcomes. This is the same criterion we use in linear regression, but unlike linear regression, we can't just rely on this term alone. If we try to estimate a function purely on this term, we'll tend to get functions that hug the outcomes too closely, resulting in functions that have this rough and wiggly shape. Good for minimizing prediction error, but bad for generalizing the future data. That's where the penalty term comes in. 
It's a functional, which means that it takes in the function as an input and outputs a number. We can design this penalty term to be higher when the function is overly rough or wavy. For example, one penalty term we can use is the integral of the squared second derivative of the function. Wiggly functions tend to have higher second derivatives over their domain, causing this integral to be higher. These two terms in the penalized least squares criterion work against each other, but this conflict serves a purpose. In the end, the estimated function needs to strike a balance between good predictions and having a nice, smooth form. But we just need one last thing. Instead of just searching for a generic function, we often restrict our search to a specific family or a specific space of functions. For example, we could choose to focus on the space consisting of functions that are absolutely continuous, have derivatives up to the m minus 1th order that are also absolutely continuous, and whose mth derivative is square integrable on the region from a to b. You don't need to know what any of that means. All you need to know is that you can define a function space based on the qualities that the member functions share. So now that we have a way to define our estimated function, we still have a major problem. We don't really have a concrete way to evaluate the function at a predictor. We don't even know what the function looks like, so evaluating it is a no-go. And this is where Grace Waba comes in. In their seminal 1971 paper, George Kimmeldorf and Grace Waba published an astonishing result regarding a solution to the penalized least squares problem. Their result is known as the kimmeldorf waba representer theorem, and it states that the function that minimizes the penalized least squared criterion takes the following form. There is a lot to unpack with this theorem, so we'll walk through it slowly. Here, these betas are just numbers. There are coefficients, just like the coefficients in a linear regression. But this time, there are n of these coefficients, one for each observation we made. But instead of the predictors themselves being used, they've been put aside a special function which I've denoted as capital K. So, according to Kimmeldorf and Waba, the function that minimizes the penalized least squares is a linear combination of these K functions. Instead of needing to estimate infinitely many points to get the function we want, all we need to do is estimate n parameters. This representer theorem turns an impossible, infinite problem into an easy, finite problem. It's one thing to see this result, and it's another to actually believe that it works. So I've set up a little visualization for you. The screen function represents a relationship between the predictor x and the outcome y. This would be an example of a function that we'd like to estimate from data. I'm going to observe three noisy observations from this relationship and show them as red points. Since there's noise, you can see that these dots don't exactly line up with the true underlying function. Our goal is to recreate the green function based on these red dots. Now's a good time to introduce these k functions. One insight that Professor Waba and her collaborator had was that they needed to look within a very special function space called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space to try to minimize the penalized least squares criterion. I know I lost like 90% of you by saying that, but stay with me. A reproducing kernel Hilbert space is a type of function space with useful properties. Technically speaking, Hilbert spaces don't have to have functions as members, but for our purposes, that's what they're going to contain. Hilbert spaces have an inner product, which gives us a notion of how similar two items in the space are. Since our Hilbert space is full of functions, the inner product tells us how similar two functions are. Reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces get their name from the fact that they contain special functions called reproducing kernels, which I'll denote as k. If we equip it with an observation from our dataset, we'll get a function. And if we take the inner product of this kernel with any other function that's also in the Hilbert space, this will make it as if we took the same observation and evaluated it at this function. The kernel helps reproduce this function evaluation. So to estimate the function, all we need is data and to choose a kernel. Back to our visualization, we're going to take each of our observations and put it in a kernel function. There are lots of different kernel functions we can use, but the one I'm going to use is called the Gaussian kernel. According to the Kimmeldorf representer theorem, the true underlying function can be estimated as a linear combination of these kernel functions. This may be hard to see with the kernel functions in their current form, but this is what we get when we actually add them up in a linear combination. Playing around with the coefficients gives us different curvy functions. So minimizing the penalized least squares leads to the coefficients that would lead us to get an optimal fit based on the data we saw. 
Since their paper was published, Kimmeldorf and Wappa's results have been generalized to countless other applications, to different loss functions, different penalty functions, and all sorts of different types of functions. In this video, I've only dealt with the simple case where the domain of the function was a single predictor, but these methods have much more interesting applications ranging from machine learning, to hand on climate data, to even medical image processing, all of them using smoothing splines in some form. That's why Grace Waba is called the mother of smoothing splines. I'm gonna be totally honest here and say that this is not the proudest I've been for a video. This material is right at the limit of my understanding, but I hope I've been able to teach you just a little bit about how important this work is. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, I hope you'll subscribe for the channel for more statistics content. It's been a lifelong goal of mine to get to 100,000 subscribers and we're so close. You can stay updated with what I do and get extra content if you sign up for the channel newsletter. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one.